Welcome, and thank you for joining here today. After brief opening remarks, members will, rec will receive testimony from our witnesses today, and then the hearing will be open to member questions. Members will be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members, and in order of arrival for those members who have joined us after the hearing was called to order. When you are recognized, you will be asked to unmute your microphone and we'll have five minutes to ask your questions or make a comment. If you are not speaking, I ask that you remain muted in order to minimize background noise. In order to get as many questions as possible, the timer will stay consistently visible on your screen. In consultation with the ranking member and pursuant to rule 11E, I want to make members of the subcommittee aware that other members of the full committee may join us today. Good afternoon and thank you everyone for participating today. On the first hearing in the 117th Congress of the subcommittee, on Nutrition, Oversight, and Department Operations. I am honored to serve as chairwoman of this crucial subcommittee and want to publicly express my full commitment to crafting impact, impactful, lasting policy. Before beginning the substance of today's hearing, I want to emphasize to my colleagues on this subcommittee that our work will require bipartisan engagement and cooperation. Over this Congress, we will be tasked with evaluating our response to COVID-19, leading our communities out of this concurrent crisis and tackling a new farm bill. I am steadfast in my commitment to ensuring everyone has a seat at the table as we approach these monumental tasks. I look forward to working with the ranking member, Mr. Bacon, and all of the other members on this subcommittee. Please know that my door is always open to you. In addition to my distinguished friends and colleagues on the subcommittee, we are very pleased and grateful to welcome a panel of experts today. Thank you all for being here. I look forward to introducing you and hearing your testimony shortly. The title of today's hearing, The Future of SNAP, Moving Past the Pandemic. The purpose of this hearing is to recount the lessons we have learned about food insecurity and nutrition access during the COVID-19 crisis, and also to use those lessons as a roadmap for closing the Garing gaps in policy, which left so many Americans food insecure in the first place. After witnessing the events of the past 15 months, there should be no doubt about the tremendous need for SNAP and other nutrition programs. Temporary increases to SNAP benefits and accommodations made to state administrators, along with creative approaches to feeding students learning from home, and the amazing work of food banks across the country, have helped to guard against the worst consequences that should have occurred during this concurrent health and economic crisis. The built-in responsiveness of SNAP to shifting economic conditions has supported working families who during this crisis found themselves in uncertain economic conditions. Thankfully, efforts to expand and strengthen the nutrition safety nets have for the most part succeeded. As we will hear from our panel of expert witnesses today, SNAP during COVID has been crucial for those suddenly without an income, as well as parents forced to choose between a job and caring for their children in remote school. Ms. Davis and Ms. Wilson will testify to the strain of a household suddenly without the means to provide. Doctors Bauer and Boynton Joyner, I'm sorry, and Boynton Jarrett will offer data and clinical evidence of the precarious situation created by the pandemic, especially for women and children, and how nutrition assistance is essential. Mr. Whitford, Executive Director of Water Gardens Ministries in Missouri, will talk about the charity work of his mission and work training centers. This testimony, I hope, will help to illustrate what I know to be true from firsthand experience, that SNAP is a hand up and not a handout for Americans thriving to achieve self-sufficiency. Today's testimony will show that fear of hunger 
is an economic is not an economic motivator. It is an obstacle to success and a threat to public health. And that hunger does not discriminate. It exists in every one of our districts. Hunger affects our friends, our neighbors, the elderly, the disabled, single, single mothers and working fathers, and people of all races and beliefs. During this hearing, I am sure we may also hear some concerns about the SNAP program. Things like SNAP discourages work, that emergency allotments and a 15% increase in benefits are too expensive, that there's fraud within the program that requires quality control measures. While anecdotally, those things at times may be true, these programs do work and they are a lifesaver. I know this because they saved my life. As a young mother, I worked two jobs and attended school, and I still qualified for benefits. SNAP allowed me to put food in my children's mouth while I worked my way towards economic stability. Even when I'm stable and could support my family, my commitment towards making sure that people had access to food continued. As a missionary in my church, I worked with the Bread of Life ministry for many years to promote feeding hungry people around the world. And as a volunteer in my community, I have spent countless hours at local food banks. That memory of the stress and the threat of hunger for my children remains a reality for me. And I take it into this work as chairwoman of this subcommittee. My lived experiences have shown me that SNAP and other safety net programs are not just handouts for people unwilling to work towards self-sufficiency. They are critical supports, which ensure that hunger is not another obstacle in the way of Americans striving for stability. On this subcommittee, we have a unique opportunity to ensure that these supports are strengthened for Americans in each of our districts. I am excited about this work, and I look forward to continuing to deliver on this promise for the American people. With that, I want to once again welcome all of you today and give a special thanks to our panel for sharing their time and expertise. I'd like to welcome at this time the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bankett, Mr. Bacon, for any opening remarks that he would like to give. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your, your words. It's been a pleasure uh, working with you in the 117th Congress uh, in this capacity. I appreciate the spirit of teamwork uh, that you're bringing to uh, the subcommittee. I just want to initially state, state, too, that I agree with you. SNAP fulfills a, a much-needed uh, program in our community, and I appreciate your personal experiences with that. With that said, though, I do think it merits some review now as we're coming out of COVID. How do we want to go forward uh, as we're moving past uh, this COVID pandemic. I do wanna offer a good afternoon to everyone. I wanna welcome all of our witnesses. Uh, thank you for taking time to share your knowledge, experiences and advice, how to best move forward in our missions to ensure those in need have access to SNAP. Based on the title of this hearing, I'm hopeful we can use today to discuss not only the department's emergency response to COVID, but where improvements is needed and how we can better serve our communities. We need to start planning a return to normalcy as progress uh, takes us past COVID. We, re we responded effectively, in my mind, to COVID, but now we're on, that, on the tail end of this pandemic. Our economy is coming back open and our plans should adjust accordingly. I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the subcommittee's previous work related to SNAP. I believe there are four themes to consider as Congress shifts from emergency spending and programming uh, to a thoughtful policy and a return to normalcy. First, serving recipients through innovation, flexibility, and program delivery. We need to reassess this. Pursuing independence through employment and training. Returning to and maintaining program integrity and improving access and promoting healthy foods and improved nutrition. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that there are a myriad of opportunities for serving families. There's not just one way to guarantee nutritious foods to make it into the hands of those who need it. Whether it be the expansion of on online pilots or the utilization of new distribution channels through the Farmers to Families Food Box Program, we need to think bigger about how to ensure qualif qualified households not only have access to benefit and relevant services, 
but can use them in a way that reflects 2021 and not 1972. And while work waivers granted through the former and current administrations were logical in response to COVID-19, they appear now, according to some news reports and some reporting, to be keeping some employable individuals disengaged, which reaps significant negative impacts on the families who want nothing more than to earn a living and to a small business community who wants to get business back to 100% employment. If the department and states are serious about inspiring hope and change in the lives of SNAP recipients, then it's high time to utilize the resources associated with SNAP employment and training, as well as state-based employment readiness services to do just that. And these programs must emphasize a multi-generational approach. We are long past trying and testing siloed programming. As it relates to integrity and the principles of SNAP, many facts of quality control have been waived throughout the pandemic. As the program shifts to a post-pandemic world, these waivers need to expire as written and say should return to normal modes of data collection, just as the department should return to normal modes of analysis. Lastly, and something I believe strongly in, is access to and consumption of healthy foods. Diets cannot be improved without sufficient access to healthy foods. Employment, including military readiness, healthcare costs, and general longevity are highly dependent on the foods we consume. So together with improved nutrition educational initiatives, the nutrition research funding secured in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 and the existing library of research on healthy eating, USDA is positioned to improve the nutrition of millions of households. So as we approach the next farm bill, it's time to rethink targeted and beneficial healthy eating incentives and more effective nutrition education strategies that help all families. Now that to say, I'm excited about where we go from here. And I thank you for your indulgence. I look forward to our witness testimony and Madam Chair, I yield back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bacon, for that opening statement. The chair would request that other members submit their opening statements for the record so witnesses may begin their testimony and to ensure that there is ample time for questions. At this time, we'll, I'll begin to introduce the witnesses. I'm pleased to welcome such a distinguished panel of witnesses for our hearing today. Our witnesses bring to our hearing a wide range of experience and expertise, and I thank you for joining us. Our first witness is Dr. Lauren Bauer. Dr. Bauer is a fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institute. Her research focuses on social and safety net policies, including, including on federal nutrition assistance programs and education. She's a member of the New York City Office of Community Schools Research Advisory Council and holds a BA in history and an MA and PhD in human development and social policy with a certificate in education sciences, all from Northwestern University. Welcome. Our next witness today is Ms. Odessa Davis. Ms. Davis is a mother, a college student and a paraeducator with Montgomery County Public Schools. She recently graduated from Montgomery College with a degree in business management and is also a graduate of La Cordon Bleu College of Culinary Arts in Miami. She also volunteers for the Community Action Agency, using her culinary skills to prepare food as a volunteer chef. Welcome. I intro to introduce our third witness, I'm pleased, I'm pleased to yield to our colleague on the Agricultural Committee, the distinguished woman from Missouri, Ms. Hartslinger. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. That's all right. Thank you, Chair Hayes. Uh, it's an honor to introduce Missouri's own Mr. James Whitford. Mr. Whitford has spent more than two decades fighting the perils of poverty and their impact on our communities. The organization he and his wife founded, Watered Gardens, serves both the poor and the homeless, providing an array of services, including employment readiness, education, and relief type needs. Watered Gardens Workshop is a fascinating approach where people in need trade their time for services. Mr. Whitford has a personal story that drives his work and believes that charity should be coupled with an expectation of productivity. I welcome James to today's proceedings. I look forward to his testimony. So thank you, Chair Hayes. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Hartzler. Uh, thank you for your comments. Our next witness today is Ms. Rachel Wilson. 
Ms. Wilson is a self-employed business owner in Central Florida. She is trained as a cosmetologist and works as an independent hairdresser. She is also a mother to her three children. Welcome. Our fifth and final witness today is Dr. Renee Boynton Jarrett. Dr. Boynton, Boynton Jarrett is a pediatrician and social epidemi epidemiologist and the founding director of the Vital Village Community Engagement Network. Her work focuses on the role of early life adversity as life course social determinants of health. Her current work is developing community-based strategies to promote child well-being and reduce child maltreatment using a collective impact approach in three Boston neighborhoods. Welcome to all of our witnesses today. We will now proceed to hearing your testimony. You will each have five minutes. The timer should be visible to you on your screen and will count down to zero, at which point your time has expired. Dr. Bauer, Please begin when you are ready. Good afternoon, Chair Hayes, Ranking Member Bacon, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. My name is Dr. Lauren Bauer, and I'm a fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where I'm affiliated with the Hamilton Project. In my testimony today, I will describe the state of food insecurity in the U.S., assess how federal nutrition assistance programs have supported families and the economy over the past year, and apply evidence toward making recommendations on the future, future of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. Food insecurity, especially when experienced by children, has been an acute and persistent problem in the U.S. over the past year. Congress has taken vitally important action and prevented even greater hardship. During the pandemic, nationally representative surveys consistently found overall rates of household food insecurity above 20%, and that more than one in three households with children were experiencing food insecurity. Starting in January 2021, food insecurity rates have started to decline, but remain far above pre-COVID levels. In the most recently available data from the Census Bureau covering April 28th through May 10th, 2021, about 16.6% of households were food insecure and about 22% of households with children were food insecure. Food insecurity among female-headed households and among Black and Hispanic families with children remain notably elevated above over the average. Parents will go to great lengths to protect their children from experiencing hunger. It is an urgent matter of national concern that parents are reporting that it is sometimes or often the case that, quote, the children in my household were not eating enough because we just couldn't afford enough food at rates far exceeding past precedent, precedent more than 10 percent. The food insecurity patterns we observe today will not only affect well-being and economic security in the short term, but will reverberate for decades to come. Encouragingly, research evidence, including from the past year, suggests that providing additional nutrition assistance can counteract some of the rise in food insecurity. SNAP provides insurance protection to those who are experiencing poor economic outcomes and supports those who are trying to improve their situation by leveraging powerful forces, public investment, the private sector, and choice. Evidence shows that SNAP reduces food insecurity, increases health and economic security, including economic self-sufficiency, and that we all benefit from its effects on the economy. Bipartisan support for emergency allotments, the SNAP maximum benefit increase in pandemic EBT, among others, has been critical in helping families put food on the table this past year. Although SNAP is already a highly effective program, there are modest but important steps that Congress can take to improve it as we look to the future. These reforms include automatically increasing benefit levels and ensuring that the program expands during a recession, adopting a timely and efficient process for waiving or ending SNAP work requirements, and adjusting the SNAP benefit formula to increase benefit adequacy and support work. While the COVID-19 recession is ongoing, SNAP is an integral part of the economic recovery. To augment work incentives in the SNAP program rules, Congress could increase the earnings disregard, increase the value of the EITC for childless adults, and add a basic needs allowance, all of which would increase food security among workers, 
service members, and their families. Tying a nationwide work requirement suspension to the HHS emergency declaration remains good policy. Yet, well-designed studies of SNAP work requirements do not show that they cause labor force participation, even during an economic expansion. In fact, they penalize workers and those who face meaningful barriers to consistent employment. Easing administrative burdens and tying a SNAP maximum benefit increase to economic indicators that signal a recession has started will help our country be better prepared to fight the next recession. The value of the SNAP maximum benefit is not sufficient and SNAP purchasing power has decreased even more since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. To reduce food insecurity and improve nutrition, benefit calculations and allowable purchases need modernization. I believe that ending hunger in America is possible and that it starts with SNAP. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Bauer. Our next witness, Ms. Davis, Please begin when you are ready with your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to be here today. My name is Odessa Davis. I'm a mom, a college student, a hunger advocate with Share Our Strength and Matter Food Center. I'm here to speak on the importance of nutrition programs like SNAP and school meals. Before the pandemic, my my dream was to become a chef. I got my associate's degree in Lee Cordon Blue, Miami. During that time, I had a beautiful baby boy and became a single mom. Working, I had to work minimum wage and I needed government assistance. I had to put my pride to the side and get the assistance that I needed. I got SNAP, which helped me pay my bills and decrease my stress. My son, got received Medicaid and free breakfast and lunch at school. This helped my son stay focused on his schoolwork. I wanted a better life for my son, so I updated my dream to become a multi-business owner, including a restaurant. I started working for Montgomery County Public Schools as a special ed paraeducator. Doing that, I updated my SNAP information, uh, which means working hard, my SNAP decrease. Later, my SNAPs was off and I, had, I was on the benefit cliff. Even though my job was 10 months, I, I had to work four jobs. My son ended up getting free breakfast and reduced lunch. I went back to school to get my associate's degree in business management. Thank you, thanks to my support system from scholarships, family and friends and coworkers, I wouldn't have done it without them. A lot of people do not have that support. During school, I met other moms in the same situation. I started a support group called Back on, Tra Back on Track. Sorry, 50% of my members graduated. During COVID, it became more stressful. Three of my jobs were closed because of COVID. I had to use my savings and I was denied unemployment because my full-time job, because my 10-month job was a full-time job. Even though I don't get paid during summertime, winter break, spring break, or professional day. But there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I did receive the PEBT card, and that helped me able to put, um, pay for nutritious foods such as meat and veggies. I also received food from the food pantry, and I started volunteering to pay um, to cook food for my friends and family that was not qualified for SNAP. So when they had um, got food from Food Pantry, I, I made it for them because they can't cook. So sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, I did graduate um, during the pandemic, May 2020 from Montgomery College and got my associate's degree in business management with honors. As you can see, nutrition programs such as SNAP and school meals are real helpful and decrease our stress and not have to worry about food and be able to pay for our bills. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Davis, for your testimony today. Our next witness, Mr. Whitford, please begin your testimony when you are ready. 
Good afternoon, Chairwoman Hayes and Ranking Member Bacon and the members of the subcommittee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. About 25 years ago, I was serving at a homeless mission in Fort Worth, Texas, and my heart broke as I engaged men, women, and children living on the streets. Not long after that, I met my beautiful bride, Marcia, and we married in the chapel of that same mission with homeless as our guests. Three months after that, we opened the doors to our own small, compassion-driven ministry called Watered Gardens in the Southwest Missouri community of Joplin. Now, 20 years later, our ministry is the largest privately funded poverty fighting organization in our four state area. Today, we meet tens of thousands of needs every year, helping both the poor and homeless with everything from emergency shelter to workforce development. Now, I said we help them, but really they help themselves through a unique ministry we operate called the Worth Shop. We call it a Worth Shop because we found that work awakens worth in people's lives. It's a place where people can trade their time to earn everything they need from clothing to shelter or furniture or food. Now, just last week, I sat across from Hope in our workshop, a young woman who was earning her food, and I asked her, Hope, oh, why do you earn your food here instead of going to get it free from somewhere else? She said, I like it this way. I feel better about myself. Now, I've heard countless comments like that over the years. One man said, you take the shame out of the game. Uh, one lady named Beth, who was earning her food by knitting stocking caps for newborns in the local hospital, called me later, left a voice message and said, thank you for treating me as equal. Now, beyond anecdotes, research bears this out also. The American Journal of Applied Psychology published a paper in 2015 titled Personality Change Following Unemployment, a study of 6,000 unemployed adults. They discovered the longer people are without work, the more they suffer. Specifically, they found a decline in three psychosocial metrics, agreeableness, openness, and conscientiousness. In other words, people become disheartened and grumpy when they're not working. So, if we want to really help energize people to get back in the workforce, then we should couple our charity with an expectation to be productive because people feel better about themselves when dignity is restored. Now, we do this at our mission every day, viewing people who many call poor and needy as people who also have great potential, capacity, and ability. April was one of those. When she first stepped into our doors, she was homeless, addicted, had lost her kids. She was on SNAP, had been in and out of HUD housing, but it was at the mission, surrounded by people who cared for her, that she found the courage to get clean, get a job, and turn in her SNAP card. She said that last part was one of the hardest things she'd ever done because she had never known that she had the ability to provide for herself. But with a compassionate support team, she did it. Not only that, but she got her kids back, went back to school, and then she ended up working full-time as our office manager. Now, I've got a lot of other firsthand stories of people finding freedom from dependency simply because we viewed them as unique individuals with unique gifts rather than charity cases and tend to be stuck on the receiving end of someone's benevolence. Unfortunately, I have no shortage of stories that go in a different direction. Penny was horribly addicted to alcohol, would stand on a median with a cardboard sign that read food stamps half price just to get another drink. Now, the right kind of help, rehabilitation and development, they're available for guys like Kenny, but for him and countless others, means-tested welfare programs disincentivize work that would otherwise lead to a flourishing life. James Madison, debating on the floor of the House in 1794, asserted charity is no part of the duty of government. 21 years later, that makes sense to me. The government doesn't know Kinney, April, Beth, or Hope. I know them. And without a personal knowledge of each individual and what's really going on in their lives, needs cannot be met in a way that doesn't trap people in dependency and strip them of dignity. Charity has never been administered well from the government. FDR himself admitted this in his 1935 State of the Union address. After comparing dependency on relief as a narcotic, he went on to promise the federal government must and shall quit this business of relief. That was sound conviction, because although the government might be able to feed people, it can never give those struggling in poverty what justice demands, dignity and friendship. That comes by way of compassionate neighbors, like the ones who volunteer at my mission, who also develop vital relationships with those who come for food. So I implore this committee, please consider what you can do to safeguard the future of those vital relationships that are certainly undermined or crowded out when food simply comes on a card with nothing required. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. 
And now we have Dr. Boynton Jarrett. When you're ready, please unmute and begin your testimony. Chair Hayes, Ranking Member Bacon, and distinguished members of the committee, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee to provide testimony on the important role of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program for families and children during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. I am honored to be here. My name is Dr. Renee Boynton Jarrett. I'm a pediatrician at Boston Medical Center, the largest safety net hospital in New England, an associate professor of pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine, a researcher on social and structural factors that impact population health, and the founding director of Vital Village Networks. In partnership with community, residents, and organizations, Vital Village develops strategies to promote child well-being and advance health and educational equity through research, data sharing, and collective action. I'm also a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Committee on Exploring the Opportunity Gap for Young Children from Birth to Age Eight. As a primary care pediatrician at a safety net hospital, I know firsthand that all parents, regardless of personal resources, seek to ensure that their children have what they need to thrive. Such necessities include nutritious food, a safe and stable home, high quality child care and education and health care. We know that when children lack access to these basic necessities, even for brief periods of time, their health is jeopardized. Research consistently shows that when children live in families struggling with food insecurity, they're more likely to be in poor health, hospitalized, and at risk for developmental and learning delays. Adults and children who are food insecure also experience increased rates of mental health issues. However, supporting children's health and developmental goals goes well beyond ensuring that they receive proper nutrition. Parental well-being is foundational to healthy growth of children and their development. And when mothers are able to afford the basic needs for their children and are well supported, they're less likely to be depressed or anxious and able to provide responsive caregiving that children need to develop healthy. Currently, who gets help and how much help they receive from society is driven by a narrative of deservingness. Yet food insecurity is distressing and painful. Children who are food insecure experience physical, cognitive, and emotional awareness of hunger. And I ask, what is our moral and ethical responsibility? Unfortunately, due to persistent structural inequities, low wage work, and lack of high quality, affordable child care, financial stability is out of reach for many families. Black, indigenous, Latina, and immigrant mothers in particular are disproportionately shut out of systems that promote economic advancement due to discrimination and systemic racism. Well before the pandemic, I met mothers in my clinic who worked multiple jobs, owned their own businesses, and despite their best efforts, struggled to put food on the table for their children. Parents in food insecure households routinely make trade-offs between food and basic necessities such as utilities. Due to food scarcity during the pandemic, an estimated 13 million children or one in six may experience food insecurity this year. Mental health issues have been climbing among those who are food insecure. And for these families, programs like SNAP and school meals and WIC are crucial to filling the gap between insufficient incomes and the cost of raising children. SNAP is not only effective in reducing food insecurity, but improves child and maternal health outcomes. During the pandemic, we've seen dramatic increases in food insecurity and other hardships among family with school and childcare closures, the shuttering of businesses and service sectors that disproportionately employ women. These circumstances have placed an outsized burden of economic hardship and stress on mothers and women of color have been more profoundly impacted by these economic shocks because they hold a higher share of low wage service industry jobs. Expansion of SNAP and the Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer Program passed in relief packages by Congress and have been a lifeline for many families during this pandemic. But unfortunately, these are scheduled to sunset without further action. Failure to ensure the nutritional needs of children are met will exacerbate inequities in health and educational attainment. The time is now to move from short-term policy solutions to permanently expand eligibility and access to government nutrition programs. Working in partnership with families and communities to generate solutions is crucial. 
as vaccination rates increase and as schools and childcare settings reopen and as people return to work, we cannot lose sight of three things. First, the longstanding structural inequities that existed before the pandemic. Second, the lessons learned during the pandemic, including the essential role of partnerships with families and communities. And third, the urgent need for long-term policy solutions that respond to the realities families, women, and children face. In order to live in a country where all children have the opportunity to reach their fullest potential, we must seek to understand ways in which current recovery efforts are leaving women and mothers behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd and Jarrett, for your testimony. I apologize, an error I skipped, Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Whitford, for your testimony previously. And now we will hear from our final witness, Ms. Wilson, when you're ready, if you would unmute and please begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Hayes and the rest of the council. I have done things a little differently than it seems like um, a lot of the other speakers have. I have decided to speak from my heart and I haven't written out a full testimony. The first thing I want you to understand is that when we talk about kids, we're talking about my kids. We're talking about these ones. These kids that have the best part of anyone that I could possibly talk about. This is Grace on her 14th birthday applying for her first job because she knows what it means to struggle. She spends her days on my roof under a full moon trying to manifest things, good things for my family and for herself and understanding body positive image. This is Tyler. I have set a standard for Tyler to understand that SNAP is not a way of life. Government assistance is not a way of life. And for him, entry-level position is a job with the Brevard County School District with teachers' benefits and teachers' pay. And he is doing amazing. This is Jack. Jack is five. He has three different behavior disorders, including autism spectrum disorder. He does Taekwondo to understand self-discipline and control. He is, I am doing my very best with government assistance to get them as, the assistance that they need and the therapy that he needs through the government program. My job as a mother is to set the standard for these kids as to what acceptable is, to understand that government assistance is not a way of life. They do not need to feel the burden of what poverty feels like or a pandemic crisis. I have a few notes, so if I get a little bit distracted, please bear with me. Before COVID, I was self-sustaining. I had a great income. I could take care of my kids on my own. Like I said, I've grown up on government assistance. I do not want that for my kids. Right now, when, since the salons have opened back up, I am now working at 50% capacity of what I was before COVID, whether it's people are scared to come in due to lack of vaccines or because of the, um, the virus that's out there or because they've decided that that uh, hair, hair and makeup is, is just not an expense that they're willing to, to put into their budget. Um, sometimes as parents, we have to understand that we have to set aside all of our pride to make sure that our kids don't feel the push of poverty, that their job as a kid is to do well in school, to be healthy, functional adults, and not worry about what they have to eat in the evening or during the day. I have looked into a lot of different jobs when I hear people tell me that I need to get a second job. I've looked at McDonald's. I've looked at Sonic. I have worked as a manager of a fast food restaurant. They pay exactly $11 an hour to start out with. That's $440 a week before taxes and $339 a week after taxes. The total on that is $1,356 a month after taxes. In Florida, you have to prove that you make three times the amount of income to afford a household. As a legal requirement, I have to have three bedrooms. A three bedroom house in Florida is $1,000 a month. I can't even prove that on a management position at a fast food restaurant. SNAP has been a lifeline for me since the pandemic to be able to give my kids what they need, the food that they need, the lack of concern 
other than their schoolwork and doing well. My daughter wants to be a pediatric oncologist. The last thing she needs to worry about is how much food she has on the dinner table. She needs to worry about her schoolwork and what school she chooses to go to because it has the best dual enrollment program for an associate's degree. It is, it is not their job to feel this. SNAP is, SNAP, SNAP is supplemental. But SNAP is a step up. SNAP is a way to help me get my feet back under me after a pandemic and to build my clientele back up to provide the life that my children need from this point forward. But sometimes we need help. We just need help. Just because we need help does not mean that we need to live under the means of basic human decency. We're not looking for it for the rest of our lives. We're just looking for it for a short time to help us get back to where we're going and provide a functional, healthy lifestyle for our kids. Thank you, Chairwoman, that'll be all. Thank you so much, Ms. Wilson, for sharing your very heartfelt opening statement with us today. That is all of our members. At this time, we will recognize members for questioning. Every, the members on the committee will be recognized in the order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority members. You will be recognized for five minutes each in order to allow us to get to as many questions as possible. Please keep your microphones muted until you are recognized in order to minimize background noise. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Davis, we are pleased to welcome you to the House Committee on Agriculture for this subcommittee hearing. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Your story is my story. Your testimony clearly demonstrates that SNAP is a crucial support system which enables recipients to have peace of mind while working towards economic stability for themselves and their families. You testified that you recently hit the benefits cliff, which is an arbitrary dollar amount above which you are cut off from benefits just as you were beginning to feel stable. Can you, can you describe to this committee how the end of your SNAP eligibility is affecting your household budget even as your income from working has increased? Hi, uh, sure, I can do that. Um, I can honestly say having, getting help from SNAP um, helps us a lot, but when, when we start doing better, we feel like we're being punished. So I can say for myself, I really felt like I was being punished for just getting a little bit ahead. Um, and I was still struggling. So even though I achieved something, it was like, they took it away. So I just, um, um, they took away something that I still needed. I wasn't financially ready to be financially steady to pay for everything. So yeah, so I felt like I was being punished. Thank you. Your testimony also demonstrates that SNAP was just one part of your family's larger budget and economic stability. In Montgomery County, where you live, they have a very high cost of living. Have you had to make any other sacrifices to stay in Montgomery County? And how did the end of your benefits impact your housing considerations? Um, yes, I love Montgomery County, but it's, the prices are high. I have to live with my mom. Um, I try applying for programs, other programs, but I'm not qualified for it because of my salary from MCPS. Um, so it, it's, it's a real struggle. I think of the education in Montgomery County for my son, and that's what keeps me going. So that's why I, I stay at MC, uh, Montgomery County. Thank you. Ms. Wilson, you had similar testimony about a working mom who through no fault of your own, your hours were cut and you're trying to do everything that you can. Um, I think it's, it's important to note that this is this is the face of our SNAP beneficiaries right now, our children, not people who willingly choose not to work. As you said, kids should have the responsibility of just being children. Can you please describe how this stress has affected you and your children as you struggled with 
um, reduced hours with a less of an income and still trying to put food on the table? Absolutely. I have not allowed my kids to feel the stress of what's going on. I have taken it on all on myself. I have I apologize if I get a little bit emotional. I have spent countless hours locked in the bathroom, crying, trying to figure out how to take care of my kids without them understanding what's going on, countless hours in my bedroom, not wanting them to feel these things. I remember when I first called SNAP and I first got in contact with a gal who uh, helps with Second Harvest and I called her completely ugly crying because I didn't know what I could do. Um, my ben um, my work hours being cut down, I haven't been able to make my rent payment. The only thing that is saving me right now is the COVID restrictions of eviction. I've been working on paying bills and my car payment, making sure that I can get to and from work and my kids can get to school and making sure there's food provided on the table. The fact that SNAP has been able to provide provide those benefits for my kids to eat healthy meals. I've been able to pay a few more bills. I've been able to um, make small payments to my landlord. Um, but aside from that, my kids, I've, I've not allowed them to feel that because I don't want them to feel that. It's not their job to feel that. They don't need to know what I'm struggling through. They just need to live healthy lives as kids and worry about their studies and worry about mom being home with them and cooking dinner and helping with homework. That's their job. Thank you so much, Ms. Wilson. That's all I have for questioning. I now, I thank both of you for, for sharing your stories here with the committee today. I now recognize the gentleman from Nebraska for five minutes, the ranking member, Mr. Bacon, for his question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, this. And I appreciate, too, uh, Ms. Davis and Ms. Wilson's uh, stories and, and sharing uh, their journey. And I think, it, again, it does show where SNAP provides a very valuable and important role. And there's time where people need this. And COVID's really caused uh, more of these situations. So we thank you for sharing. And I, too, uh, am concerned about the cliff effect in that I think it does could hold some people back for trying to get more employment. So we need to look, relook at how we can um, modify policies to minimize the, the, the problems of cliff effects. So I appreciate you sharing. My first question is to Dr. Bauer, Dr. Jarrett, and Mr. Whit Whitford. Uh, as you all know, in response to the pandemic, Congress provided nearly $70 billion in additional nutrition program programming and funds. Were any of you surveyed about these needs or asked to provide testimony <clears throat> during this uh, pandemic and in the lead up of all this aid. Thank you. I'll go first to Dr. Bauer. Um, in my role at a think tank, uh, one of my jobs is to, to provide uh, education and evidence to policymakers. So yes, I did um, you know, speak publicly on um, you know, potential uh, federal response to the COVID-19 pandemic on nutrition assistance programs. So did you say you talked to people on the, com on the agriculture committee here? I did, yes. Okay, thank you. How about you, Dr. Jarrett? I did not speak to members of the Agricultural Committee um, um, during the during these changes. Thank you, Mr. Whitford? No, I, I did not and, and was not asked. And one of the concerns we had is we didn't have committee hearings as we were determining $70 billion uh, in, in new spending. Uh, a question for, a doc, for you three again, you know, just recently it's reported that 43% of businesses say they want to hire, but they can't find employees right now. 43%, it's a pre pretty huge number. Yet last month, unemployment went up a, a little bit. So businesses, are, and I know businesses are closing early because they have lack of employees. So my question is, do you think government has any role in this or have we inadvertently had a negative impact here, Dr. Bauer? I know you were suggesting otherwise in your testimony, but curious uh, for your thoughts. Uh, yes, I both suggest otherwise, and the evidence suggests otherwise. So SNAP is a program that stimulates the economy, helping to turn the tide. 
um, from contraction to expansion. So every dollar um, that the federal government and SNAP generates more than a dollar, more like a dollar fifty or a dollar seventy in local economic activity. Um, we, you know, we give one of the reasons that SNAP is so effective is because of the way that it's targeted to families that need the benefits and want to spend those benefits quickly. Um, and so SNAP is an integral part of getting the economy back on track. Dr. Jarrett, what's what's your thoughts? We have 43% of businesses wanting to hire, yet unemployment went up. Has government in a, inadvertently caused that? Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. I want to echo the comments of Dr. Bauer in that um, SNAP really boosts local economy. It supports local farmers, small businesses, all size food retailers. So there was a study done by the USDA that showed a $1 billion investment in SNAP would lead to nearly 500 new agricultural jobs and um, over $32 million in, in revenue for the agricultural industry. So if you've ever seen a child who's used like they're what we call them locally is bounty bucks to get try a mango to try fresh fruits and vegetables to get collard greens at the local farmers markets schools do it families do it and it's so encouraging um, for children but i have another piece to the response so as of december 2020 only 13 percent of child centers and family care homes remained closed we know high quality child care is is essential for women, mothers, and primary caregivers to return to the workforce. This is, I think, our key structural responsibility that must be met with policies that provide safety for early care and education providers, as well as prioritize high quality and accessible child care so that children you, can be sure. healthy and develop well. I gotta give, I gotta give Mr. Whitford a chance. <laughs> I got three I, seconds left. Mr. Whitford. Yeah, I just want to say four words to remember, no way and hell no. Now, these were the words spoken by two individuals just recently at our mission when they were approached and, and I said, hey, how are things going? Uh, uh, the one guy said, well, yeah, everything's going great. I said, are you employed? He said, no way. And then began to tell me how he thought that employment would actually hurt the benefits that he's receiving. I shared that in a staff meeting. One of my directors said, that's interesting. I had another conversation with another person and they said almost something very similar. They said, hell no. Now, one of those guys actually pulled out his food stamp card when I was meeting with him and he said, you know, they put $300 on this card last month. I don't even know what I'm gonna do with it. And then he said, I think I'll go down and buy I'm some- Sorry, food. Mr. Whitford, to cut you off, but the gentleman's time has so to that's not you. Okay, that's not any way to stimulate the economy. Thank you, Dr. Whitford, or Mr. Whitford. I yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, before I recognize this witness, I just wanna add that while the economy is starting to recover as businesses reopen, there are still 8 million fewer jobs than there were before the pandemic. And jobs are down more than twice as much in low paying industries compared to those that pay more. The majority of jobs lost because of the pandemic were in industries paying low average wages and not providing health coverage. The very jobs that many of our public benefit recipients work. Also, there's the issue of childcare. So there's so much to consider when we talk about unemployment and the economy and returning to work. And I now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, for five minutes for your questioning. Ms. Adams, can you please unmute and begin your testimony? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. Thank you so much uh, uh, to you and the ranking member for hosting the hearing today. Uh, thank you to our witnesses uh, as well for their testimony. Uh, I am uh, delighted that we're having uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, right now, 16.6% of households and 22% of households with children uh, in the U.S. are facing uh, food insecurity. In my state alone, 1.5 million people currently depend on SNAP to put food on their tables. And in the county that I represent, uh, there are more than 150,000 people receiving SNAP benefits, which is an increase of more than 50,000 since March of last year. So it's clear that there's a hunger crisis in our nation. And while SNAP is a critical lifeline to families, the current benefit level is not simply inadequate. The average benefit is only $1.40 per person per meal. And so that's why soon I'm gonna be reintroducing the closing the meal gap, which permanently increases benefits by 30%. 
and eliminates the time limit on benefits because working hard is just not enough if you don't make enough. I know that firsthand when I was a student raising two children on my own, I depended on SNAP to put food on my table. And I might not be here today if I didn't get that help uh, when I needed it. Uh, so as you know, the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic exacerbated the difficulties faced uh, by those with the least, including people receiving uh, SNAP. And so uh, my question is, do you think that flexibility such as telephonic signatures face-to-face -face interviews, waivers, and automatic extensions of the certification periods were significant contributors to the success of uh, local government in managing a large influx in enroll enrollees and ensuring that the program continued to run smoothly during the pandemic? And do you believe that it would be beneficial for some of all of, uh, of, of flexibilities uh, if they were made permanent? Uh, Ms. Wilson? I apologize. I had to unmute my my camera. I understand. I, I don't believe that assistance should be made permanent. However, I do believe that they should be based off of a sliding scale fee. I need to go back to um, the previous speaker before you who had stated that somebody said, hell no, he's not going to get a job because of the benefits. Well, I will tell you as a mother, the one thing that I am fully aware of at all times is how much money I make because if I make $1 more than what SNAP assistance says that I can make, which is $2,300 a month gross to raise two children, I will lose $500 a month assistance in SNAP benefits. $2,300 a month minus taxes will not even pay my rent and my electric bill. And that is a very terrifying thing. Yeah. I, well, you, uh -huh. Go ahead. No. Please, um, if you had another question, please go ahead, because I was just well, going to comment that what you said in your testimony really did hit me hard that throughout your life, a SNAP has been the only reason that you and your children have had the ability to eat like normal human beings do. And of course, that's a message I think our committee in Congress uh, more broadly needs to hear. But in my district here in Mecklenburg County, families utilize SNAP each month to keep food on their tables. And I know how critical that these programs are. Uh, uh, and they are a lifeline to families who are struggling. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of the program to your own family and to ensuring that you can put food on your table? And how has it helped you get by during these difficult times? Absolutely. Growing up in poverty, SNAP has been a huge lifeline for me, especially growing up as a child. Um, there are several times in my life that I have done um, uh, productive actions in my life, trying to make sure that my children grew up in a different lifestyle. There are a lot of times that I have needed SNAP benefits to help me get to where I'm going in life. Before okay. the before the pandemic, I did not need SNAP assistance because SNAP had assisted me throughout my lifetime to get to a position in my life where I can provide for my children. Okay, thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Uh, in your testimony, you imply that SNAP and federal assistance programs of charity have no place in government. I, I respectfully, wholly disagree. Uh, SNAP and our federal safety net programs are a hand out, and many of us on this committee uh, once utilized the program. So do you believe that private charities and nonprofit profits could immediately and effectively provide for the 42 million Americans who are currently supported uh, by SNAP? That's a great question. I, I Sorry, unfortunately, I, the time has expired for the answer, but right. uh, we can submit the question in writing so that you can um, share your response for uh, the gentle lady from North Carolina. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. At this time, I call on the gentleman from Arkansas, Rep Representative Crawford, if you are Yes, ma'am. Oh, there you are. If you can unmute and ask your questions. Thank you. Um, I think we can all agree that SNAP is a useful tool for those in need. Um, I would say, though, that if it were the be-all, end-all of nutrition requirements, probably wouldn't be having this hearing today. I think that we wouldn't need food banks if, if SNAP was uh, performing at peak level and, and answering all the needs 
uh, nutrition uh, needs of, of the, the food insecure. And so there are some issues that, that I think are, are fair game that should be talked about. And, and we also know that the administration of SNAP benefits um, oftentimes um, are, are not effective. Uh, and and I'll, I'll use that as a kind way of saying that sometimes um, they're mismanaged. Um, but my point is this, that I, you know, I haven't heard a heck of a lot of talk about the benefits of um, food banks, and we're talking about the need for nutrition uh, in the context of healthy foods, fruit and, and vegetables, and, you know, fresh foods and things like that. In many cases, in food deserts, um, our constituents rely exclusively on convenience stores where they're, by definition, um, consuming almost exclusively processed foods. So their nutrition is, is uh, compromised as a result. Um, and that's because in those remote areas, like in the first district of Arkansas that I represent, sometimes you just can't get a grocery store in some of these smaller towns that it just, it's cost prohibitive. So I'm just wondering if anybody wants to weigh in on how we reach these remote areas, rural communities that don't have the resources, how do we reach them with, um, uh, with, with nutritious foods like fresh fruit, vegetables, and, and other proteins mm. in a meaningful way that make them less reliant on processed foods? Um, that seems to me to be a problem. And then another question that has come up is this, this benefits cliff that we talk about. Um, I'm still looking for someone to help us figure out why we don't taper those benefits to match your income. If you're in a situation where you rely on benefits and you walk right up to the edge of that cliff on your job, but you're afraid to go any further because you're about to lose all those benefits. And so that constrains you from being able to advance in your career for fear that you're going to lose any help that you might receive. I would think that we would need to match benefits uh, proportionately um, in inversely proportionate to your income so that you can you can make your way off of that, taper those benefits down, and, and then it's at obviously the end goal being that you don't need that, and, and now you can allow others to come in and benefit from those programs and repeat the process as it's necessary. And, and I don't think we've had meaningful conversations about how we taper those benefits off, how we, um, we, we encourage and incentivize um, more consumption of fresh fruit, vegetables, and other protein sources? What are we doing to, to educate consumers about how to prepare more nutritious meals so they can benefit? Um, and and, the, and these, these taxpayer resources that are expended to help meet those nutritional requirements can then be done in a more efficient and effective manner. Uh, and so uh, in the last minute and a half that I have, anybody wants to weigh in on that, on, on any of those topics, I'm all ears. I actually, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, sure, I, so go okay, ahead. Go ahead, yeah, you. All right, so um, just uh, very quickly, um, in terms of rewarding work through the SNAP program, as I said, you know, on your way to the benefit cliff, actually work is quite rewarded and total household resources increase as you take on extra hours, as you take, um, uh, as you get a raise. In fact, as you enter the workforce, it is better to be on SNAP and working than it is to not. Um, and in terms of tapering off the benefit cliff, uh, broad-based categorical eligibility is the primary mechanism that we do it now. And that is the strategy um, going forward. In terms of improving nutrition, all of our best research, including federally uh, and congressionally mandated randomized controlled trials, so that increasing benefit adequacy is, is how um, families purchase more you know, dark leafy greens and fruits and vegetables, that families know what they want to buy. They need the resources to do it. And so increasing benefit adequacy will improve nutrition and diet quality. Well, I uh, appreciate the input. I wish we had more time. I've got 10 seconds left, enough time to say thank you, Madam Chair, and I will yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Crawford. And I am encouraged by your testimony. It sounds like an area where we can find some bipartisan collaboration um, because the program is already means tested. However, the benefits have been found to be too small. So we want to encourage work and want to support people as they are stabilizing their families and getting back to work. So I look forward to having some productive discussions on this committee on that very topic. 
Um, with that, I will now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, if you would unmute your microphone and begin your testimony. I want to thank you, Madam Chair. This is a really an exceptional hearing. And I, at my church, Madam Chair, we have two sayings. You can't teach what you don't know, and you can't lead where you won't go. Uh, your testimony this morning certainly uh, was uh, indicative of the type of leadership for the subcommittee that you want to exhibit. Uh, I've always felt as though if you're going to be a shepherd, then you have got to smell like sheep. And so, Madam Chair, again, thank you. Ms. Wilson, Ms. Davis, thank you for the courage uh, of your testimony. Your stories, uh, in many ways, reminded me of my own childhood and the lengths that my mother went to on behalf of me and my family. My mother uh, taught school. My mother was a musician, a business owner, and she took college courses on the side. My uh, family was always on the edge uh, financially, and at times we depended on government benefits, the AF, uh, AFDC, and others. My mother worked hard to provide for her family, as you both of you, and as you millions of other families and other mothers on SNAP. Uh, food security is also personal to me for other reasons. Uh, in the early 70s, I helped create and administer the Free Breakfast for Children program in Chicago as a member of the Black Panther Party. And in 1972, uh, throughout our nation, uh, the Black Panther Party was feeding 25,000 children free breakfast every morning before they went to school. All that is to say that I understand firsthand the importance of food security program. And it's clear to me that we have much work to do. The pandemic exacerbated already existing hunger issues. In Illinois, 22% of kids in Cook County and 17% of children in Will County face food insecurity in 2020. That number is far too high. And Madam Chair, it goes without saying that I stand ready to work with you uh, to alleviate these issues. Dr. Marr, it is disheartening for me to see the high percentage of Black and Hispanic adults who responded that is sometimes often the case that in the past week, quote, the children of my household were not eating enough to because we just couldn't afford enough food. Uh, I'm working on programs to eliminate that program by uh, covering how hot or prepared food. Can you describe how this change will help reduce food insecurity? Sure, so anything that is gonna make food more affordable uh, helps benefits stretch more, but I think that it's a combination of, um, of programs that is going to um, improve uh, food insecurity, food security among children over the coming year. Um, you know, the devastation of school closures um, meant the loss of prepared school meal programs and Congress in its wisdom passed the pandemic EBT program. And my research found um, the pandemic EBT reduced very low food security among children by 30% in the week that it went out. Um, it's reauthorization and now it's really rolling out the door. Um, and that's going to do a tremendous amount. Um, it also makes sense that, you know, we always know that schools are closed in the summer um, and, and converting pandemic EBT into summer EBT for this summer, um, you know, is, is well validated and research and evidence based. And I think the combination of prepared meals and additional EBT uh, benefits targeted to kids. Uh, I, 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 Mayor, I, I have another, uh, I have another question I need to ask and I have my time is running out. Uh, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Davis, uh, in your testimony and in your experience, um, this not provide enough flexibility to provide uh, necessities for your families. Are there any change in regards to the flexibility of SNAP that you recommend? 
The only thing that I would do within SNAP is that they worked on a sliding scale fee so that I didn't have to worry about a dollar amount that I made that would take $500 a month away from my children. I budget my $500 a month into four weeks and I know how much of that I could spend every week to make sure that the SNAP benefits provide for the entire month. But if I make $1 more than the allotted amount of time, uh, allotted amount of money, they take $500 yes. away from me. If it worked on a sliding scale fee, then they took away 50 cents for every extra dollar that I made. I would be able to more right, work myself off of SNAP benefits. Are you back, Madam Chair? Thank you so much, uh, Representative Rush. Uh, at this time, I would like to recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins. If you would unmute your microphone and please begin your test. Of, uh, I'm sorry, your questions for the witnesses. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to thank all of our witnesses today for taking time to share their stories with us. Your experience and knowledge an important role in helping this committee do its job. And I appreciate the chance to hear from all of you, even if it's virtually. Uh, I will say it is a good day when we're finally having a discussion on moving past the pandemic, and I think we're all ready to, to get back to a sense of normalcy. Uh, as we have these conversations today, the most frequent complaint I'm hearing from businesses and employers in my district is the lack of applications and subsequent inability to hire. This frustration spans across all industries from skill work. Connect, and we've touched on that a bit today. Uh, we have heard today in several testimonies that people don't want to work for fear of losing benefits because for many, uh, this is all they've ever known. But also, I, I agree with the sliding scale approach as opposed to the cliff because that does seem punitive. Mr. Whitford, you have firsthand experience at helping get people back into work. Could you share some of those thoughts as we come out of COVID-19 and businesses are desperately in need of workers? And what can this committee do to encourage people to seek out employment and take steps towards self-sufficiency? Yeah, well, it, it really, for us, it is inspiration and relationships. So people come in our doors and uh, we are immediately recognizing every individual as um, a person made in the image of God, you know, and so there is a natural tendency for all of us to create and be productive. And so what we found is that it's best to just take a person up on that right as they're coming in the doors and begin to have them helping with whatever they can. And that's where our workshop comes in. And uh, what we found is that out of our, just out of our emergency shelter alone, typically we're able to see an employment rate out of our shelter of about 60%, which is great when you consider that people coming in don't have a job at all. And we really do believe that that has to do with how we're engaging the person as soon as we see them and uh, allowing them to begin to earn things that they need. A lot of people have not realized that they have the ability that they have, and it requires relationship, encouragement, and inspiration, all the things that the private sector is so good at doing when it comes to charity work. And that's really uh, the key to helping people get back into work. But it has been a problem uh, of late. It's been very difficult. And again, you know, it's one testimony after another that I have of people who have felt like they're held back. Uh, they're fearful, really, they are fearful. It's a, it's a, it is a true thing. I mean, the welfare cliff is a fearful thing. And when you become dependent upon it, it it's really hard to, to break free from it. And that's, that's what we found. So I, I think that one thing that we could do, you know, if, if you wanted to help mission leaders like me who are trying to help people get back to work, we really do need to regard this idea of subsidiarity. Uh, it's, it's this, uh, from back in uh, an encyclical written by Pope Pius XI, Quadragesimo Anno, and he says, just as it's gravely wrong to take from individuals what they can do with their own initiative, it is a grave evil and disturbance of right order to assign to a higher association what a lesser, more subordinate organization can do. In other words, there are concentric circles of help that should exist. And when the federal government is doing that work for my neighbor in need, it disrupts things that are not gonna allow us to build the relationships that we need to and inspire and encourage people to get a job. Okay, well, I, I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair, it looks okay. I see the clock was moving. It looked like it was stuck. I got a little bit of time left. Uh, Mr. Whitfield, uh, you had, or Whitford, you had mentioned in your testimony instances of individuals selling their SNAP benefits for 50 cents on the dollar, as well as able bodied individuals 
going to work, but only for him to the table so as not to interfere with this SNAP el eligibility. It goes without saying, that's not how these benefits are intended to function. Could you talk a little bit about that and specifically any changes that would help the program function as intended uh, as, as a temporary handout to those who need it most with the end goal being self-sufficiency and not a lifetime of government dependency? I think you have about 45 seconds. <laughs> well, we've got to get as close to the problem as possible. I think, uh, uh, again, going back to this idea of uh, a neighbor knowing his neighbor best, we really do have to uh, allow for uh, my, my, my recommendation would be let's start with letting the states actually administer these programs and uh, we'd be able to work, I'd be able to work with my legislators in my state to see if we could do some things that would actually improve how the program is working and how, how we could actually help people uh, get where they where they want to be. Uh, so um, that's, yeah, you know, again, we're just seeing a continuous problem of people that are, are, are getting hung up uh, much of it is a fear factor uh, depend and, and dependency. Uh, thank you. I yield back. Thank you so much. Um, as I'm listening to the testimony, I'm reminded that the scripture also says, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. And when I needed clothing, you clothed me. So that is also a part of our responsibility. Um, with that, uh, thank you so much for your testimony. I think the next, is Mr. Sablan on? No, he is not. Uh, so we'll move on to the next member on this side. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Carbajal, if you will unmute, unmute your mic and begin your testimony. I'm sorry, your questioning. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Let me just start by saying I how I, I personally know how critical food assistance can be for families. When I was young, uh, these programs actually helped reduce the financial barriers for my parents who were struggling to get by, uh, making minimum wage, working as farm workers, my father was. Uh, it worked so hard to give my siblings and I a, a, a better way of life. It wasn't for the lack of not working. He was working six, sometimes seven days a week, but it was difficult making ends meet. I was fortunate to have had an opportunity to graduate from a great university, first attend the university, then graduate, uh, serve our country in the Marine Corps, serve my community and local government, and now in Congress. Ensuring that all children have consistent access to fresh and nutritious food year round is critical for our kids to be able to grow up healthy and prepared for any career they might choose, including maybe even serving in Congress. Dr. Boynton, Jared, how can the SNAP program be enhanced and modernized to incentivize families with children to purchase and incorporate fresh and nutritious food consistently in their diets? Thank you so much for your remarks and for sharing your story and the invitation to this question. You know, um, the work that I do with Vital Village Network really arises from the question you shared. I'm trained as a pediatrician. I should be in a clinic right now. Um, but you know what? We spent $3.8 trillion on healthcare last year. The vast majority is spent on treating chronic illnesses. There actually is strong evidence to show that SNAP is a, a benefit that acts actually helps prevent the development of metabolic syndromes in adulthood, which are associated with diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, um, obesity, and overweight. So there are tremendous benefits to the early childhood investment, investing in nutritious food, reducing stress, um, and distress experienced by parents, and really calling hunger what it is. There, there, I, I don't know of a single person who experienced chronic food insecurity or hunger that doesn't remember what that felt like. We actually can consider chronic food insecurity and hunger uh, extremely adverse experience and potentially traumatic experience. So 
it's really my belief that we need to work much more collaboratively to build a more resilient food system. And SNAP is a big piece of that, but also really engaging parents and members of the community in helping to modify the policy so that it doesn't um, do the things that Ms. Wilson and Ms. Davis have shared around creating higher degrees of stress, higher degrees of anxiety by removing benefits as folks become socially mobile and advance. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Boyne. I'm just trying to add a, a, get a couple other questions in there. So thank you very much. Uh, um, Ms. Wilson, I really appreciate uh, your courage to share your personal story with us. You know, I think nobody wants to be dependent on public assistance. Uh, and I appreciate your sharing your story with us. I also appreciate uh, Ms. my colleague, Mr. Crawford's uh, comments about how we can work to develop a better system where we're, we don't penalize people. Because it would be foolish for somebody who is gonna be a few dollars away from being cut off to wanna <laughs> give up that benefit when you really rely on that. I know that. Really? So the question should be, how do we help people transition or enhance their quality of life without penalizing them. And I think we need to do better in that respect. So I appreciate Representative Crawford's uh, comments and I, I sure hope uh, that I can work, we can work together to address this issue as the chairwoman also said earlier. Um, one of the main ways we can make sure SNAP fulfills its mission to fight hunger is to ensure that the benefit is adequate. Often SNAP recipients still rely on food, ba food banks and other supports to make ends meet for their families. Like much of our country, rural areas in my district on the Central Coast face specific challenges, such as cost to travel to get food or other hardships. Dr. Bauer, how can we make sure that SNAP allotments reflect the time and financial costs families face to purchase their groceries and what other changes would you recommend to make sure families have a benefit adequate to meet their needs for food? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Barr, before you begin to answer, the time has expired. So we will send that question and you can submit a written answer for the record if you mind. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, you're right, I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you, thank you so much. I now recognize the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Hartler. Hartzler, if you would unmute your microphone and begin your questioning. Thank you, Chairwoman Hayes, and thank you for each of our witnesses here. I've appreciated the, the insights and the heart that you all have uh, to try to make everyone um, have, a, have a good and, and life and, and have food. And, Mr. Whitford, I appreciate uh, your heart and your story of you and your wife and the ministry that you started and dedicated yourself to right here in Missouri. And uh, I, I know that a lot of ministries and a lot of organizations are moving past just providing food um, and including moving on to the workforce development and other things in order to help people uh, succeed in life. Could you expand a little bit on how your uh, helping individuals in your ministry connect to work and to a, to a better life. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So we have um, a, a program called uh, Forge. It's a center for virtue and work. And this is a long-term program. Uh, it's focused on character development and work readiness. It really is a workforce development program. So we have different tracks. Maybe somebody who doesn't have their GED begins to work on that. If they, uh, if not, they go toward a national career readiness certification track. If they already have their GED, uh, they go through a lot of classes uh, like stewardship and economics, government and legal living, um, healthy living, seven steps to Christian maturity and the like. And then they move more into their work ready phase. And that includes things like uh, doing functional capacity evaluations to determine what a person is able to do. Um, we go through uh, personality assessments. Uh, we do computer literacy training, um, mock interviews, resume writing, and a lot of other things that go along with that. Getting ready to go into the workforce. And then those individuals will bridge into our um, com community of partnerships, really with local employers. And, uh, and they go through a, a season of coaching 
it's an internship of sorts for eight weeks. And many of them end up right there because as you know, uh, base employment is a great need these days. And, and a lot of employers are just looking for folks who will you know, show up to work on time and, and be ready to go and be consistent and reliable. And that's certainly one of the things that we're doing in our 12 to 15 month uh, long-term program. That's wonderful. So this, it sounds like a workforce development program that you have established yourself. Um, are you working with any government programs um, or are these all just uh, generated within your own organization? Well, it's certainly there are some clients that we are uh, engaging who are uh, receiving some help from other gov government organizations. But we really have uh, decided we want to try to do as much as we can from a voluntary basis, uh, from the private sector, engaging our local community to be involved on a volunteer level. And so uh, we have developed a lot of things that uh, there might be analogous government counterparts, but I, I just believe that the private sector can do an incredible amount if, uh, if given the opportunity. Uh, there was a, a, a wonderful, powerful scripture shared a minute ago that I know all of us uh, take to heart, but could you just clarify when Jesus was talking about how we should feed the hungry and clothe them and your brother in need? Was he saying that the government should do that, or who who was he saying should do that? Well, no, he was talking to uh, he was talking to individuals, uh, and and that's that's a key point to be made. In fact, the name of our ministry, Watered Gardens, comes out of Isaiah fifty eight, where God is speaking to His people to be really charitable, uh, to 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 feed and to clothe and to shelter. But in Isaiah fifty eight ten, God says, "If you'll extend yourself." to the hungry. So he wants us to do more than feed. He really wants us to develop relationship with people. If you'll extend yourself to the hungry, you'll be like a watered garden and like a spring whose waters never fail. It's a beautiful passage. Absolutely. Have you talked to any other entities across this country about your program to replicate it? I know that you're uh, serving a four state region, but uh, we need to have, I think, programs like yours all over. Yeah, we are right now. We're talking with leaders in different communities around the nation to consider even our workshop model. Could that be something that uh, is a collaborative that could occur in a community where organizations, churches, missions could refer people uh, as a way to restore dignity and give it an opportunity for people to earn what they need? Great. I appreciate your work and your heart, and uh, thank you very much, and I'll yield back. Thank you so much, Ms. Hartzler, and thank you for that lesson in virtue, because again, I, I agree that Jesus was talking to the people, and we are a government of the people, for the people, by the people, who represent the people, so we are those people. Um, with that, I will now recognize the gentlelady from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer, if you will unmute your mic and begin your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am so grateful, and while I appreciate the discussion on virtue, I do want to reorient the committee back to the task at hand, which is uh, the incredible opportunity, but also the obligation to care for those in need in our community. And in my case, that includes uh, this important government program to feed children because of a uh, heartbreaking pandemic. So. Food insecurity is plaguing my state. And while I appreciate the role of the churches, I think that we have, as the government, certainly have an important role in this as well, to ensure equity and to make sure that everyone is kindly welcome as we do in New Hampshire. So I wanna take this opportunity to elevate SNAP because this program has never been more than central than it has been in the past year. COVID-19 has exacerbated food insecurity. In my district and across our state, approximately one in seven people, including one in five children, have been struggling with hunger during the pandemic. And thankfully, federal nutrition programs like SNAP have been providing critical support to families, both during, prior to, and after COVID-19. Let's remember that SNAP is not a luxurious program. In 2019, the average SNAP benefit for recipients in my state was approximately $1.22 per meal. And I would certainly challenge anyone on this committee to make a meal 
a nutritious meal for $1.22. But even that modest amount can make a difference when a family has to pinch pennies to put food on the table every night. And I appreciate our witnesses and indeed our members on the committee talking about their own personal experience of supplemental uh, nutrition. As the pandemic rocked our economy, many had to rely on SNAP for the very first time. And I participated in food drives and in the distribution of food during COVID and met many families who were in line to pick up food for the very first time. To keep up with this need, I've been proud to champion increases in food assistance programming in the COVID response packages passed by Congress. We must also continue to destigmatize participation in SNAP. Each SNAP participant has a story from serious health ailments to the lack of affordable, accessible childcare, to the lack of jobs in an economically hard hit region. And all of these challenges and many more represent broader, broader problems that deserve the attention of Congress. But in the meantime, Americans still need to eat. Efforts to cut or weaken SNAP, in my view, are simply cruel. No one should have to go hungry in America. SNAP is a critical lifeline to those who need modest support feeding themselves and their families. So on that note, Dr. Boynton Jarrett, Thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. I appreciated your description of the multiple challenges that have faced low-income mothers and children during the pandemic. And I'm particularly interested in your use of a trauma-informed approach. I am the founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Task Force to End Sexual Violence. And I spent years advocating for first responders, courts, and other stakeholders to have a trauma-informed approach to avoid re-traumatizing survivors. Dr. Boynton Jarrett, can you elaborate about how your trauma-informed approach works in relation to food insecurity and federal nutrition programs and what your recommendations are? Thank you for the question and I'm honored to answer this question. I think it's critically important and it really begins with science. We understand that chronic and cumulative adversities, particularly in early childhood, have a critical impact on the developing bodies and brains of children. So if we think about chronic food insecurity, which often is associated with housing insecurity, inadequate or insufficient or low quality childcare, poverty and a number of adversities. We are actually knowing, we also actually have evidence that investing in um, mitigating and preventing those early childhood adversities have numerous um, impacts on health, developmental and life course. So who people will become as adults? Will they go on to higher education? What, what, what um, skills and capacities will they bring, bring to parents and how will they engage in our economy in productive ways in the future. So Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And that's what we're talking about. Why would we ever allow a child to go hungry or to be denied a benefit. Um, so a trauma-informed approach really, one, understands that neuroscience and then says, well, wow, our food system is, is not resilient. It is insufficient. Sorry, Dr. Point and Jarrett, I, I have to cut you off. The Thank time you, and I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you, I'm sorry about that. Um, I now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Baird, if he's on. Thank you, Madam Chair. My camera should be up, and so... Uh, uh, your camera's not on, sir. I, you have to turn on your camera first. Okay. Sorry. There you go. Thank you. I now recognize you to ask your questions. So my question really goes to... Just a minute. Uh, Do we stop the, the timer? Your camera just went off again. There you go. Okay. I now okay. recognize Mr. Beard. Okay, so what I really want to know, Mr. Whitford, is, um, is um, you know, a lot of programs uh, start off at, at, with being a food distribution, and then later they move into other areas. Uh, how have you been able to look 
for making access to other uh, supportive organizations uh, with regard to helping needs. Uh, Representative Baird, I'm so sorry that I, I you'll have to re-ask the question. You were cutting in and out. I just couldn't get it. Okay. You know, a lot of organizations start off distributing food. Can you hear me now, okay? Yes, I can. Okay. They start off distributing food, and uh, then they move and evolve into uh, additional uh, identification and assistance with helping those uh, individuals on the SNAP program. Uh, with other areas that are beneficial and helpful. So would you care to elaborate on how you have looked for ways to help individuals, not only uh, because of the SNAP and the food uh, issue, which is extremely important, but then how to look for other, uh, other sources of benefit and help? Did that come through okay? Yeah, I think so, and I, and I hope I understand your question correctly. So uh, one of the things that we've really worked hard on is a collaborative model in our community. So many years ago, uh, I launched an, an online networking tool in our city that we actually help other communities get connected with now too, where organizations are sharing information, not, not only just on individuals that they're helping so that we can better understand how to uh, steward our resources more effectively and target our charity more accurately, but it also allows us to know what's being offered in the community and what would be the next best source of help for an individual. So again, there's no one, uh, I, I think we should get away from like a one-stop shop idea. In this day and age, we don't need to be thinking in centralization of services. I really believe that we can connect together using technology that's available and be able to operate more cohesively as a unit in a community. Because although Watered Gardens, my ministry does a lot of different stuff, we don't cover every base. And so there is a need to collaborate with other organizations. I hope that that answers that question. Yes, it does. And in, uh, I guess I'd like to move to Ms. Davis and Ms. Wilson. I've really appreciated uh, them sharing their stories. Uh, so as a member of this committee, I would like to have uh, their perspective on how we might improve the program. And so, Ms. Davis, if you want to start. Um, I would say with, to improve the program is the person you're assigned to works more with their person. So I was assigned somebody, but I really didn't talk to them. It was more transfer papers. And when my... I didn't know my food stamps were cut off. I didn't get the letter to a month later and I needed my card. So for them to ease the process of you slowly de not getting your um, food stamps, that, that's, that communication, that's what I would say needs to improve. Fine tuning the efficacy and the efficiency of the delivery system. Right. Is that, when, is that, yeah. So we can adjust to um, get our minds prepared to not have it anymore because yep. I didn't, luckily, I had support to help me pay for stuff, but because I didn't know I was struggling and I was crying and I had to decide, like, am I going to per keep going for my dream or am I going to? stop and try to stay on it until I'm feel comfortable enough to go out there again. And luckily I had support to go ahead and continue on what I was doing. So, but a lot of people are not fortunate about that with that. Well, thank you for that information. Madam Chair, do I, I have, do I have time I for answer that? Step in for one second. If I may step in for one second, I think what Ms. Davis is trying to say is that a taper off effect would be way more essential to the government process than just a cutoff effect. If I may note, there are two chairmen on here who have now noted that government assistance has put them where they are today. Government assistance gave their families the ability to support them and push them to be more productive members of society, which puts them in the position that they are today. But I think what Ms. Davis was trying to say is a taper off effect would be way more effective than just making a specific dollar amount and being cut off from a several hundred dollar amount of providing food for her family. A scalable, a scalable situation is what you're really suggesting, isn't it? Make yes, it scalable. Yes, sir. 
dollar amount. Yep. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, all of the witnesses being here. Appreciate the opportunity to be on this, uh, serve on this committee. And uh, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Beard, for your thoughtful questions. I now recognize the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Panetta, if you would unmute and ask your questions. Understood. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate this opportunity. And let me thank all of the witnesses uh, for your time, for your preparation, for your willingness to share not just your expertise, but your life experience with us today. So thank you very much. Once again, I'm Jimmy Panetta. Now, I represent the Central Coast of California, uh, just above my colleague Salute Carbajal's district. And, and in our district, in my district, um, we got a lot of bounty. Uh, agriculture is the number one industry. We got a lot of specialty crops, so a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. And unfortunately, technology hasn't caught up with the way how you harvest that. So we need a lot of people to do that. Uh, however, we don't just have bounty, bounty here. We got a lot of beauty too. So that makes it a little bit expensive, actually a lot expensive to live here on the Central Coast. And that's why a lot of the people that put food on our table that are surrounded by fresh fruits and vegetables every day doesn't necessarily mean that those people have access to those same fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, long before the pandemic, the very farm workers that put that food on our table and provided us with that food insecurity throughout the pandemic, food security throughout the pandemic, struggled disproportionately with hunger in 2019. And what I mean by that, nearly 9% of my constituents relied on SNAP. However, over the past year, as we've seen throughout the country, in my district, especially in the Salinas Valley, one in four children was food insecure. And by the end of last year, household food insecurity spiked to above 35% in certain parts of my district. Now, I saw it firsthand when I, when I would go out and volunteer at the food banks and hand out the food and seeing the growing lines pretty much in all parts of the Central Coast. But what I've realized and what I believe is that we cannot food bank, we couldn't food bank our way out of the pandemic, and we cannot food bank our way out of hunger. And so I am grateful that we have finally increased SNAP benefits by 50% through the end of September, but we're obviously going to have to work more to do more to prevent a federal food cliff when uh, come that day. Now, I believe we need to look to the future and to see how we can improve SNAP, not just as a response to the pandemic, but as a response to the new normal. And that in doing that, I do believe that flexibility is crucial, is critical. So let's take that look when we start uh, uh, developing the next farm bill, let's work together so that we can ensure that this lifeline program as we're hearing today, this lifeline program better serves all of those who need it. Now I know many of the witnesses have been on for an hour and a half, so I'm just gonna narrow it down. Dr. Bauer, I'm gonna pick on you. The other witnesses can kind of zone out for the remaining minutes that I have to let you know. Uh, Dr. Bauer, um, you know, the U.S. Government Accountability Office issued a report that analyzed that more than uh, two dozen studies on food insecurity among college students. It took a look at that. And it found that America's college campuses have alarmingly high rates of hunger with 39% of all low-income students experiencing food insecurity. Many low-income students are also the parents of small children. And these individuals work incredible hours to study, raise their families, and pay their bills, as we heard from one of our witnesses today. That is why earlier this year, Representatives Gomez, Harder, and myself introduced the Enhanced Access to SNAP, or EATS Act, to make permanent changes to the rules that have long denied SNAP to low-income Americans solely due to their status as college students. Dr. Bauer, can you elaborate on the ramifications of the existing student rule, and how would amending the current law to remove the burdensome work requirements improve student access, particularly for first-generation low-income students? Uh, certainly. So that's right. Um, college students are required to work in order to receive benefits. Um, but what we really have right now is a college completion crisis. I mean, we want to do everything we can to ensure that once students enroll, they're able to complete. And part of that um, is having enough food on the table. And so I certainly think that um, you know there is reform necessary, including looking at the backgrounds um, of what students have. You know, we are not doing that currently when we're assessing whether students are eligible for SNAP, um, including through the work requirement. Um, and so there are a variety of ways that we can better support first-gen low-income students to get those degrees, including for student parents. 
Great. Now, also, I've introduced the Military Hunger Prevention Act, which establishes basic needs allowance to help low-income military families purchase food. Can you elaborate on the impacts of counting the BHS as income when determining service members' SNAP eligibility? Uh, certainly. So I think what we don't want to do is, is punish service members for serving. Um, and that's sort of how the formula works right now. A basic needs allowance would, would allow us to reward work, reward service, by ensuring that low-income service members are eligible for SNAP when they should be. Great. Dr. Bauer, thank you. My time's up. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Panetta. I now recognize, is she on the gentlelady from Florida? Uh, Representative Kamek, if you will unmute your microphone and begin to ask your questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate everybody being on here today. Uh, and, and as my, my good friend and colleague, Mr. Panetta mentioned, uh, these witnesses have been on here for quite some time. And so there may be a bit of uh, some repeat questions here, but the thing that I find encouraging is that Republican, Democrat, regardless, we all are looking to get to the same end point. And I think we all have a little bit of a different way of how we get there, but the fact that we all have the same end goal is very encouraging. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm gonna start with some prepared remarks and then jump into a few questions. And again, apologies for some repeat questions. But you know, since its inception, the goal of the food assistance has always been to provide temporary emergency relief to those most in need. And in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic in which millions across the country found themselves suddenly out of work, relief was expanded and waivers were provided, new programs were rolled out to both provide food for those in need, but also provide America's producers with much needed support in the midst of a collapsing supply chain. Now, like my friend and colleague, Representative Panetta, I represent a very rural district, which is rich in agriculture production. Um, and so we face some of the similar pro, uh, challenges. One of these programs, Farmers to Families Food Box Program, supplied these boxes of American-grown produ uh, produce to families in need. And in Florida specifically, farmers and food banks alike were very excited to participate in the food box program with farmers able to supply boxes of food to those who needed it most, while much of their traditional customer, customer base stayed the same. And I know firsthand, because I was part of some of the distribution work here, uh, the food banks in my district and elsewhere spoke to me about lines around the block to receive these boxes of food with fresh, healthy American-grown produce. And I heard from several of our Florida growers and producers about how the program was a lifeline during this unprecedented time. So uh, to that end, Dr. Boynton, do you mind touching on how, now that the food box program has ended, how we might be able to look at ways that we can continue to promote healthy food, support our producers, and meet the needs of our families and individuals that are struggling, um, and what that might look like, both under SNAP, but also how we can engage our community partners alike in this. Oh, thank you so much for the question. And I think um, you actually hit on what I think is the most critical answer. I really do think it needs to be collaboratively co-designed with community partners so that we're utilizing all of the assets and existing resources within communities most productively. And we are reaching the families that are deepest in need. And when we think about it, we rarely engage those who are most socially marginalized in these types of decision making, in these types of policy strategies, but in all of my work locally through Boston Medical Center, Vital Village, those are the best ideas. Those are the most effective ideas. Actually, throughout this pandemic, we have numerous examples of ideas that actually originated from community members and neighbors helping neighbors that could be scaled and built into more formal policies and infrastructures. I think what's most exciting around these direct par partnerships between producers and families is really the uh, ways that children can become engaged. Um, if you see a child that grows a cucumber and tastes the cucumber they grew for the first time, it's like nothing else, right? What better way to stimulate nutrition and a sense of ownership and responsibility for children? And as we've talked about many times, really honor their dignity and shared humanity. Thank you for the question. 
Thank you, Dr. Boynton. And you gave me a perfect segue. My next, probably last question, since I'm running short on time, is for Mr. Whitford. Your testimony is laced with references to dignity, community, civility, relationships, compassion. And um, as someone myself who was not even actually 10 years ago almost um, was homeless, I understand firsthand um, the struggles that participants in this program um, go through. Uh, but I would like to know, in, in an ideal world, when it comes to those that you're trying to help and get back on their feet, where do you see the sweet spot for government with community organizations? Uh, again, I want to go back to, uh, to the idea of, uh, of subsidiarity and, 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 and properly layering that. I, I think it's, I, so there is a, you know, the, the research talks about crowd out. There's a real crowd out effect that occurs when uh, government's involved in helping local community people in need. And so, uh, we, in fact, we've even seen that. Depending on what's going on with uh, government benefits, we'll actually see a drop in some of our, in our mission market where we have a little grocery store where people come through, they have healthy options to choose from. We'll see a drop in that. So I really believe that as government back a little bit, you'll see more of the private sector and securities that will step in. And I think that's really one of the best things that government could do is just figure out how can we allow for the private sector to do what the private sector does so well, which is be charitable. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Kamek, for your really thoughtful questions. Um, I now would recognize the the gentleman from uh, the Mariana Islands, Mr. Sablan, who has joined us. Thank you so much. If you would unmute yourself you. and ask your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations on, on holding your first hearing. Uh, I apologize for my tardiness. I am juggling before between four committees, and uh, I just got noticed that I need to both to start it on natural resources, but uh, Madam Chair and, and to the witnesses, I don't have a question. I just have a short comment. I have been working for 12 years now to bring SNAP to the Northern Mariana Islands um, because we, um, the Northern Mariana, my district is one of three in the United States that are on block grant. And it is just so difficult whenever there's a disaster and we need additional funds, we have to go and legislate the funds uh, and, and, and all different kinds of difficulties. And, you know, sometimes Congress works uh, amazingly and like a slow boat, it just becomes a little faster or a little slower. But yeah, hunger is a different. Yesterday I went around and I visited uh, elderly at home. I went to first to a place where they congregate. And then I followed this vehicle that distributes uh, food to the homebound and had short time, some conversations with those who are homebound. And um, some of them, um, you know, lost their qualification for food assistance for because uh, their income is $2 higher than the formula, or I mean the, the, um, the threshold. I mean, I'm not some, one of them actually, $2 higher than the threshold. And uh, she lost uh, something like $96 worth of food aid. That's what she was getting a month. That's the enhanced one because usually we get $25 a month for a single for an individual. Um, but uh, just I'm working I, and I'll continue to work hard. Uh, and I, I ask the chairwoman's uh, assistance and cooperation because um, this is really, I wouldn't be working this hard and asking for this if I don't think it was necessary. But I want to thank the witnesses for being here and, and sharing their thoughts with the committee. Madam Chair, we thank you very much. With all due respect, I need to run back to natural resources for the votes that has just been called. Thank, thank you so you much, much, Mr. Sablan, and thank you for joining us even briefly. Thank you. The next Republican witness that I, I mean, I'm sorry, member that I have is the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud. 
but I don't see him. Are you on? Okay, that's fine. We'll go to Mr. Lawson, the gentleman from Florida, if you would unmute for your questioning, and we'll go back to Mr. Cloud as soon as he's on the platform. Mr. Lawson, if you want to unmute and begin your questions. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and um, I want to thank you and the ranking member Johnson uh, for this hearing. It's a very uh, important hearing. Uh, to the members, uh, uh, I want to welcome all of you uh, to uh, the meeting today. Uh, and I represent the 5th Congressional District, which stretches along uh, in North Florida, along the border of uh, Alabama, so to speak, at Georgia, uh, and, and down to uh, uh, Jacksonville, uh, about 200 miles or so uh, in this district, and two major cities uh, in between, and most other areas of rural and, and farming uh, uh, community. Uh, uh, my district staff and I uh, volunteer frequently uh, to help with food banks and the farm share. Uh, and I was doing this even when uh, I was in the uh, Florida legislature and making sure that food banks and farm share stuff was funded when I chaired the Agriculture Committee uh, uh, in the House and in the Senate. Uh, uh, what I'm really uh, getting at is that, uh, and this question probably uh, will go to uh, Ms. Davis and uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, can you both speak how uh, TFAB programs play a role in making sure that our families have nutrition, food, nutritionist uh, food to eat when SNAP just won't, uh, wasn't enough to help them meet the entire month of meals uh, during this pandemic. And, and I want to say this in, in conjunction is that, uh, you know, we have a lot of hurricanes. And one of the things that I had to petition the governor with is allow, uh, to allow SNAP recipients to get hot meals uh, for their families when they have no place to cook. Uh, uh, stuff of this nature, and so, and that probably need to be a part of any legislation that we pass now. I just want to see how you all respond to it. Um, I'll go first. Um, I think it's good for them to be access to hot meals because um, I, there's people that can't, don't have a stove. They can't, um, they're not very good, skilled at cooking or know much about it. So if they could get access to somebody else making it for them and still have that self-pride of still getting, you know, actual meals and not have to always go to junk food. So I, I think that's a good idea. So I will follow up and say regarding hot meals when it comes to natural disasters and hurricanes. When the hurricanes do come around, we don't have electricity, we don't have gas. Um, the hot meals, because they are denied on EBT SNAP, we can't, we, I mean, we they have some supermarkets that do provide cold meals that you can heat in a microwave, however, it's really a heartbreaking experience to explain to your kids, yes, I have a box of chicken from Publix, but we can't eat it hot because there's nothing to heat it up with. The kids should not feel the pressure of that. So hot meals being denied on EBT SNAP, I think is, is not the best idea, but I understand why the idea is there. However, I don't, what I don't understand is what the difference is between having a hot meal and a cold meal and taking it home and warming it up. Okay, that, the only, like, the and, only and, difference and, is, is, is 15 minutes and hoping that you have a microwave to run that, that has power to it during a hurricane to warm it up for your children. Okay. You know, uh, one of the things that's very prevalent, and I was asked uh, Mr. Waffen, uh, uh, why uh, is it that it's so much bad publicity come out with people, in your opinion, on SNAP benefits uh, simply due to the fact that people see them in grocery stores and so forth and get food and they think it's to a disadvantage that they're getting each meal. They can't get alcohol and all the cigarettes, all the other things that people think they get. How, how do you think that uh, 
the, the news get out, and I know my time is about to run out, that people uh, feel that way about this. I don't think that, I don't think there's enough knowledge about the SNAP program. I will tell you now that there is, there, there's absolutely no availability to alcohol and tobacco, which you already know. But I, I just believe that people have a really um, skewed approach to EBT, SNAP, and government assistance. And they think that it is a free right for all. So I think getting the word out or making people more knowledgeable about the fact that EBT SNAP is truly about just um, minimum assistance and essential food needs would be probably a better approach to the situation. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Lawson. Um, I still don't see the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, so I will move on to the next witness on the majority side. I now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, if you will unmute and ask your questions, please. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, let me just say that uh, SNAP is perhaps the most important um, anti-hunger program uh, that we have. And um, charity can't do it alone. And by the way, SNAP is not charity. Uh, the majority of people who uh, are on SNAP are children, are senior citizens. Um, of those who are able to work, the majority work. They, they work uh, and they earn so little, they still qualify uh, for, for the benefit. Uh, my criticism of SNAP has been that the, uh, the benefit has been too, um, too small. I mean, on average, it's about $1.40 per person per meal. I mean, I, my Dunkin' Donuts coffee this morning cost me more than that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that in the American Rescue Package, we upped it by 15%. But talk to food banks, and they'll tell you that the people who are, uh, you know, are still coming to food banks midway through the month because their benefits have run out. Um, so this is not charity. This is our moral obligation. Um, we, all, we, we all ought to be committed uh, to making sure that nobody in this country is food insecure or goes hungry. Um, and quite frankly, uh, during the pandemic, we saw the numbers go up to like 45 million people um, who were hungry. Uh, you know, before that, it was 35 million. I mean, I, as a member of Congress, I'm ashamed that so many people in this country don't know where the next meal is going to come from. Um, and the people who are on the program defy stereotypes. Um, and the people, and and quite frankly, to, to to struggle in this country and to be poor in this country is a, is a lot of work. It's a full time job, and I really appreciate the testimony of uh, of Ms. Wilson and Ms. Davis. Um, I mean, and let me just ask you this: I mean, can you both talk about the importance of including people with lived experiences in our conversations about uh, social safety net programs like SNAP? Because I've been on this committee for a long time, and as chairman of the Rules Committee, we're doing a series of hearings hopefully leading to a White House conference on food, nutrition, health, and hunger. Uh, but we have lots of experts that come up and testify, but sometimes they miss things because they themselves haven't struggled. They haven't gone through what uh, you have gone through. So can you talk to us about I will tell you to hear you say right now that you understand that we are not people that want to live on food assistance is extremely emotional. For someone to actually understand that we want to do better is ex extremely emotional. This is not something that we want permanently. Right. As parents, we want to provide for our children, but there are circumstances that come into play that sometimes we have to set aside that pride and, and do what it takes to make sure that our kids don't feel this. So to hear just one person, just one person understand that this isn't what we want, yeah. that we're not people who don't want to work, that we're not people who refuse to work is such a breath of fresh air. I don't really have a whole lot to add to the conversation other than that, but just because I want to validate everything that you're saying Everything that you're saying is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And Ms. Um, Ms. Davis? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I'm glad you said that because 
I personally was brought up that if you go on government assistance, that you like you feel like a failure, like you messed up, that you have to go to the government for help. And for me, I had to put my pride to the side to say, I need help. And during COVID, I did not have food stamps. And I really, really needed help. So when that PET card, when I found out that I can use that to just pay my meals and stuff, that helped me and relieve some stress that I did not have to worry about what my son was going to eat during this pandemic. Even though it stopped in November, it still helped me. And I knew when it was going to stop. And then I did the food pantry. And the pantry picked up where they left off. So when people say that, I it's it's no, because I don't believe on staying on government. I go when I need help, and I know other people that go for for help because they need it, not to just be home and do nothing. So sorry. And I appreciate you both saying that because uh, I think far too often the commentary that comes out of Washington D.C. does more to stigmatize people. Uh, then help people get back uh, on on their feet. And so I appreciate both of you for, for your courage and for coming and sharing your stories. And um, and I look forward to continuing to work with you and, and others on this panel. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. McGovern. And he has been a champion on this issue. For anyone who has not already seen it, you should check out the op-ed that him and I co-authored that was released today on this very issue. Um, I now recognize the gentlelady from Louisiana for what I think is your inaugural hearing. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Letlow, please unmute your microphone and ask your questions. Thank you, Chair Hayes. To all the witnesses, thank you for your time and participation in this hearing. I join my colleagues in extending my appreciation to Ms. Davis and Ms. Wilson for, for providing your testimony and sharing your stories before the subcommittee. As the title of this hearing indicates, we are starting to see the country take strides in moving past the pandemic, and I think this is a timely conversation we're having here today. My question is for Dr. Whitford. While I'm one of the newest members of the House Committee on Agriculture, it's my understanding that the previous testimony before this committee has revealed that some organizations expect historically high levels of hunger well beyond this year. It is, my, it is alarming to hear that even the Federal Reserve is lowering expectations for May's job growth because companies cannot find individuals able or willing to work. Do you think Congress is pro providing the right balance of assistance? And what can we do to encourage and help families return to work? We've got to re thank you. We've got to remember that uh, the, the, the only way out of poverty. And I mean, I've just, again, you know, two decades of seeing this, the only way out is through work. It is through a job. Uh, that's absolutely vital, not only to, to the dignity of, of the person. And I mean, we've even heard this just from Ms. Davis and Ms. Wilson. I mean, they recognize that as well. I think we all do. So we've got to be asking ourselves, are, are we doing anything that's getting in the way of that or not? Uh, there's been talk today about how SNAP is a, a relief program for emergency use. And that's exactly right. It, in fact, it, it reminded me of a book called When Helping Hurts. And in When Helping Hurts, they describe three different types of charity, really. There's relief, there's rehabilitation, and there's development. And so many people today are really in the rehabilitation and development aside of that, uh, which requires some sort of effort or work to move forward. Relief should be reserved for the emergency cases when there's no other option. There's, there's nothing, or, in fact, our, our community uh, just uh, recognized a 10th anniversary from an F5 tornado that ripped through the center of Joplin. It was uh, of historic uh, of, uh, significance. It rendered 7,000 people homeless immediately killed 161 people. Mm. And the relief effort was amazing right then. And in fact, by the time the, by the, time the federal government got involved, uh, we had already organized our community together and we were moving forward. Uh, so that's relief. But most of the time, when we get to know people, they need rehabilitation or development and it requires effort, it requires work. I think one thing that uh, we could do, you know, that what the government could do is just 
make sure that work requirements are a part of that picture because mm -hmm. we're going to be able to, in fact, in the state of Missouri, we saw 43,000 people who were unemployed and on SNAP benefits before uh, work requirements went back into place in 2016. That number dropped by 85% afterward and incomes from those folks went up 70%. So there, you know, again, a job is the way out of poverty. There's no way that we can provide enough aid to lift anybody out of poverty. It, it will require a job and the government's got to make sure they're not stepping in the way of that for people who are not in need of relief, real relief, but rehabilitation and development. Thank you so much for your answer, Dr. Whitford. I yield back my remaining time. Thank you so much, Ms. Letlaw. I now recognize the gentlelady from Virginia who is on the full committee, but has waved on to join us today. Welcome to our subcommittee, Ms. Spamberger. If you can unmute and ask your questions, please. Thank you so much, Chair Hayes. Uh, I appreciate you allowing me to wave onto the subcommittee today, and I am grateful for you holding this hearing on the future of SNAP. I represent Virginia, Central Virginia's 7th District, and in Virginia, nearly 70% of SNAP recipients are families with children. And for these families, SNAP has been a vital source of support to put food on the table for their children before and during a global pandemic. Um, unfortunately, we have seen such a demand for food assistance that SNAP benefits uh, have been challenged. They're not enough. And food banks across my district in Central Virginia have been working tirelessly to meet the need of hungry Virginians. I have heard from food banks, from state officials, and from members of our community about the immense relief that SNAP assistance can provide a family. And in addition to helping families and children in Central Virginia and across the country, SNAP is vital to our nation's economic recovery. As Dr. Bauer mentioned in her testimony, a $1 investment in SNAP benefit, uh, benefits generates about $1.70 in economic activity uh, during an economic downturn, like the one that we find ourselves in today. And that's why I was so appreciative of our work to ensure that the American Rescue Plan extended SNAP benefits uh, through September, as well as the pandemic EBT program. But we all know that the rate of food insecurity is still higher now than it was before COVID-19. And I am grateful for each of you who are here today to speak with us. And I'm so grateful for the stories, the experience, and the expertise that you've brought to Congress. Um, Dr. Bauer, I would like to begin with you. You mentioned the SNAP Employment and Training Program, also known as SNAP ENT. Uh, in your testimony package. And, and as you know, SNAP participants have exclusive access to training and support services to help them enter the workforce through the SNAP ENT program. I was wondering if you could shed a little light on how improving the SNAP ENT program could potentially help SNAP participants find regular employment. Certainly. So I think that there's a lot we can do um, to synchronize and cohere across the workforce development programs that are supported by the federal government, whether it's through SNAP ENT, um, through programs um, that are run through the Department of Labor, through WIOA, and certainly through the TANF program. Um, you know, there's a variety of ways to support work through the SNAP program, as I've already said, through the earnings disregard, and especially through increasing uh, the EITC and making that more generous, more permanent. Mm -hmm. um, for childless workers, because that is really where we're seeing declines in labor force participation over the long term. Um, in terms of, of ENT, um, you know, certainly reforms and investments are needed to, to bulk up the program, um, especially should uh, work requirements be reinstated at some point in the future when the economy allows it. Um, even though I don't think um, that there's evidence supported continuation, um, it is certainly helpful to, to able-bodied adults without dependent to have that ENT slot um, to help them maintain access to the program should there still be local area circumstances um, that limit the, the number of jobs available. Thank you very much. Uh, just one more follow-up. In your testimony, you mentioned several options for strengthening SNAP as an automatic stabilizer. Could you explain how automatically increasing benefit levels could help ensure that people receive the help they need during a recession while having the impact uh, presumably of stabilizing our economy. Absolutely. So it certainly relates to um, the point that you made that that a dollar of SNAP is a very 
special federal dollar um, because it generates so much activity um, and because it's well targeted, it's spent so quickly. And so, you know, when we know the economy is in a recession, which we all don't always know as quickly as we knew was going to happen at the start of the pandemic, increasing SNAP benefit levels and reducing barriers to entry to the program will catch people as they fall and help slingshot not only the economy into a self-sustaining recovery, but also help our most vulnerable families when the macro economy um, is contracting. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Boynton Jarrett, um, from your experience, could you comment on the impact that multiple federal nutrition programs have on a family, WIC, SNAP, the school lunch program? How do these programs work together to serve a family in need of support? Excellent question, and thank you. Um, you know, children receive two thirds of their nutritional daily value actually from the meals they receive at school or in early care and education. So it's really like the school meal program as well as the summer meal program, and those extensions are vitally important for continuity of um, nutritional meals for children. So those are very complementary to the SNAP program. Moreover, the WIC program. Women, Infants, and Children provides healthy nutrition nutrition for women who are expecting or who are pregnant. This is critical as well because healthy nutrition during pregnancy actually sets the foundation for a healthy start in life. So we actually know that um, adversities that pregnant women face um, uh, have a longstanding impact on the health and development of children as well. And so studies have actually shown that SNAP benefits and WIC benefits for women who are expecting are associated with reduced risk for metabolic conditions such as diabetes and chronic metabolic conditions in children. So we know that the earlier we can provide consistency um, and access to consistent healthy nutrition food, nutritional foods, the better it is for healthy development, growth, and learning for children. Dr. Boyd and Jarrett, thank you so much for making that very clear uh, acknowledgement that the support to pregnant women is so vitally important to healthy babies and supporting uh, babies and young children as they ultimately uh, grow older uh, into community members. And Madam Chair, thank you for indulging a couple moments over and I yield back. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us today. We were happy to have you. I think that concludes all of our member questioning. Are there any other members who have not been heard? Okay, so before we adjourn, I invite the ranking member to share any closing comments he may have. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the thoughtful uh, conversation. I really appreciated the panelists today, uh, especially those who have their personal stories to share. And I thought it was uh, just very well done. I have to remember the STAP program is a supplementary program and it's, and it's serving well. And uh, so I wanted to make that point. I also, realize in the last farm bill that we passed out of the house, we did have some provisions that helped with the cliff effect, uh, but was taken out during reconciliation. I just think we see today uh, from the testimony that we have that there is a need for having an eye on this and to look at how we can mitigate uh, this cliff effect. I think we heard repeatedly uh, where this has had some impact. Um, so I think we have a task in front of us and I think there's some bipartisan support to do so. And finally, just what so we do need, need to have an eye for coming out of the, the pandemic. I know we're not quite there yet, but we're on the tail side of this. We still see uh, increases in poverty, but it's gone down significantly since its peak. We have more work to do, but we do have to have an eye on the fact that 43% of our employers are looking to hire and they're having a hard time with this. Uh, it is a fact that we have to deal with and we have to ensure that government uh, not just in the SNAP program, but in all the other areas that's been involved with uh, over the last six months, is not competing against those jobs. Because in the end, getting people back to work is our goal. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate your time. And I appreciate you organizing this uh, today, and I yield back. Thank you so much, Representative Bacon. Before we adjourn, I want to once again thank my colleagues for their participation in today's hearing which will help us to craft lasting, meaningful legislation on this subcommittee. I especially want to express my sincere thank yous to today's panel 
both doctors who gave incredible testimony that was very impactful and, and really shared with us the research. To Mr. Whitfield, your perspective and the information that you provided, I promise you we'll get you those questions that you were not able to answer. And to both Ms. Wilson and Ms. Davis, as the, sub as the chairwoman of this subcommittee, it was very important to me that you tell your own stories, that we found people who could come to share your experiences and your perspective. And in essence, rebut the faulty premise that people who can work choose not to. You really have shed a tremendous light on this issue and really helped us to redefine the faces of, of the people that we are helping. Um, I especially want to express my sincere thank you to this panel. Your time and knowledge are extremely valuable and we appreciate the generosity that you've shown today. One thing is clear from the testimony today, SNAP has absolutely been an essential support throughout this pandemic and will continue to be crucial for economic recovery as we climb our way out of it. The work Congress has done to bolster the program and to support related nutrition programs has provided a vital safety net for people who are working hard so that they can support themselves and their family through this extremely difficult time. We heard from Representative Lawson about the student food insecurity, and him and I just introduced a bill to address that, H.R. 3100, which I look forward to bringing, um, elevating to this committee as well. Ms. Wilson started with something very important, pictures of her children. I remind you that many of the people that we are talking about who participate in this program are children. I was a classroom teacher for 15 years before I came to Congress and the image of children with their heads on the desk who could not learn because they didn't have the energy because they haven't eaten is something that I wouldn't wish on anyone and is something that you will not forget. Those images, those children are the ones who drive my work here today. We are still in a hunger crisis and our communities still need our help. And we have a unique opportunity to take action. We've heard some at, at times there were, no, there were no hearings, there was no collaboration on these types of issues. Mr. Bacon, I say to you, we have the ability to change that. Let's work together. Let's use the information that we gathered here today to help get people fed before they have to show up at food banks. Research has shown that for every one person who is fed by a charitable, charitable organization, nine families are fed by SNAP. That is important information for us to know. Let's feed people before they have to stand in line and have the stress of food insecurity. Thank you again to my colleagues and to the witnesses today for participating in this very important hearing. I just have some housekeeping things that I have to read. Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any questions posed by a member. This hearing of the Subcommittee on Nutrition, Oversight, and Department Operations is adjourned.